pleasure today to introduce Dr. Stephanie Pierce, and she's visiting us from the not-so-cold Northeast. Uh, she's Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University, um, and she is, she got her undergraduate degree and had her early start in Canada. How many Canadians do I have in the audience today? Any Canadians? We have several. I guess they didn't represent <laughs> today. Um, Gosh. And she has her BS and her MS degrees from uh, the University of Alberta. And then she traveled east, southeast, to uh, Bristol University where she got her PhD. And then after some pretty fabulous postdoctoral opportunities, joined Harvard um, and uh, is gonna talk to us about new research. So we're getting a brand new talk, which I'm really excited about. And uh, she's done a lot of work on form function relationships in vertebrates. Not invertebrates, but invertebrates. <laughs> and including a lot of work on the spinal column, um, on how uh, essentially macroevolution of traits. And um, so very dear to my heart and <laughs> such a pleasure to have you. So thank you for coming to Texas and please take it away. All right, thank you, Julia. Is this working? We're good? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, it is a brand new talk, but I'm gonna talk about basically a new technique that has been developing over the last several years called functional adaptive landscape analysis. And I don't want you to get too scared about that. I will take you through uh, the process of this analysis and basically how we've been using it to address really big questions in vertebrate evolution. This is a very large screen. I have to figure out how I'm going to look at it. Um, okay, so in today's seminar, we're going to uh, separate it into three parts. So the first part, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction into functional adaptive landscape analysis. And then we're going to use that technique um, and apply it to two transitions in vertebrate evolution. Okay. All right. Um, so the first transition we're going to look at is the fish to tetrapod transition in the origin of terrestrial locomotion. And then we're going to switch gears and we're going to look at the so-called reptile to mammal transition and the evolution of mammalian locomotion. All right, so let's just dive right, right in with our brief introduction. So the adaptive landscape, what is it? So basically um, the adaptive landscape or the concept, concept of it came about in the early 20th century with the works of Wright and others. And uh, it was primarily applied to the genotype and to allele frequencies um, throughout populations. And so essentially the adaptive landscape itself is pretty much just a visual representation of fitness, which is characterized by fitness peaks and fitness valleys. And so it's very similar to what you would see in a, in a topographic map here. So basically the theory behind this is that selection will be working on populations to drive populations uphill, to cluster around adaptive peaks where fit fitness will be maximized. And you can see over evolutionary time, these fitness peaks may be moving around in this landscape. So basically the adaptive landscape in its sort of original form was really uh, useful in population genetics, and at microevolutionary timescales. It was also really important in the development of modern evolutionary theory. But if you read the literature, there was a, it was actually really hotly debated at the time. So in the 1940s, paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson, he applied the adaptive landscape to the phenotype and to macroevolutionary timescales. In particular, he linked large scale evolutionary events such as climate change and extinction events to basically shifting adaptive zones over evolutionary time. And this is something that he referred to as quantum evolution. He also used adaptive landscapes to try to help explain why organisms only explore a limited part of the entire phenotypic landscape. He basically proposed that this might be the case because certain combinations or certain morphological combinations may have some functional adaptive benefit well, uh, others might be maladaptive. And this can change over evolutionary time as well. 
So Simpson, he applied this phenotypic adaptive landscape to one of his, you know, most famous evolutionary transitions that he, he really liked studying, which was that of the horse. Uh, and so what he explained was that um, over time, the phenotypic and by, extensional, by extension, functional adaptations of horses changed over evolutionary time with a changing climate, in particular with a change from forests to grasslands. Now, this sort of concept of the phenotypic landscape was really um, intriguing and exciting, but it was, uh, its application was pretty limited at the time, and a lot of that had to do with the computational challenges that, it, that are you know, central to this. So over the last few years, the sort of primary application of the adaptive landscape has been through a technique called phylogenetic comparative methods. And so just to give you a sense of what is done here is you can use certain models such as ornstein Uhlenbeck models that can help you search for shifts in trait evolution throughout a phylogeny. And it can give you a sense of whether or not there are different adaptive peaks over evolutionary time. So these are just two examples here. The first one on the left is an example from our work where we looked for shifts in the number of backbone regions throughout mammalian evolution, showing that there was two big shifts throughout, um, throughout evolutionary time. The second uh, example here, these authors wanted to look at the evolution of body size in theropods, specifically wanting to better understand how small body size in birds came to be. So these phylogenetic comparative methods have, have been really great and they've given us really important insight into trait evolution over really large evolutionary timescales. But usually they're only applied to univariate data, although this is starting to change over time, which is really exciting too. But the one thing that these methods really don't help with is trying to sort of link form and function together. And that's something I'm really interested in studying um, throughout the fossil record. So more recently, um, functional performance surfaces have really started to become popular. And that's because these performance surfaces can help link form and function together. So the essential concept of a performance surface is that you sort of measure morphological variation, uh, you create a morphospace, and then you measure functional traits within that morphospace to create what's called a performance surface that can give you an idea of whether or not a species is uh, really high in performance, sitting in a performance peak, or whether or not it's, it's got low performance or sitting in a performance valley. So this is just an example of these performance surfaces. So in this study, um, the researchers, they quantified the shape variation of the four bar linkage system in the fe fish feeding system. They then took all of that shape variation and they created a morphospace uh, with all their sort of species plotted throughout their morphospace. They then measured a variety of functional traits. You know, it could have been speed of uh, catching a prey item or something like that, or the mechanical advantage of a particular muscle. They then take that trait data, they took it, and they plotted it back into this morphospace, and they created a surface. This is called a performance surface. And on this surface, we see that the red color here is indicating a performance peak, and the blue color over here is indicating a performance valley. So what you can do is you can look at where your species or taxa of interest are plotted within this performance surface to give you a sense of the relationship between form and function. So this is really, really interesting stuff. However, um, it's usually only applied to one functional trait at a time. So here we have separate performance surfaces for three different functional traits. And that's kind of, it, you know, makes me a little bit nervous because we know that morphology often imparts functional trade-offs. So we're not really getting a full sense of what's happening within this system. So really to better understand how form, function, and adaptation sort of all work together, we really need to um, combine morphology with multiple functional traits. So in 2016, my colleagues and I, we, we published a study which linked performance surfaces with the concept of adaptive landscapes. And we call this functional adaptive landscape analysis. 
So in this uh, type of study, we're able to look at the functional trade-offs associated with morphological adaptation in response to differing selective, selective regimes, such as different dietary or locomotor ecologies. So basically what this does is it combines two or more of those performance surfaces together into an adaptive landscape. And it does this by determining the relative weighting of each of the functional traits of interest under whatever selective regime you're interested in studying. So I'm gonna give you an example from our work and the general workflow of a functional adaptive landscape analysis because this is what we're gonna be looking at as we proceed through today's seminar. So in this particular study, we were looking at the humerus or upper arm bone of turtles and we specifically wanted to know if whether a morphological adaptation of the humerus bone to different locomotor ecologies resulted in different combinations of functional trade-offs. So for this study, what we did is we quantified the shape of the humerus bone and we created a morphospace. This is the first part of this um, type of analysis. So here you can see that morphospace and you can see all the different taxa that we studied. And we then grouped them together into three different locomotor ecologies, whether or not they were terrestrial turtles, semi-aquatic turtles, or marine turtles. We then took this morphological data and we measured various functional traits on that morph morphological data. We then projected those morphological traits back into the morphospace and we created performance surfaces, which is what you can see here. So there, in this study, there were four performance surfaces. On here, you can see that red is indicating a performance peak and blue is indicating a performance valley. You can also see that these different performance surfaces have different peaks and valleys. So they're sort of moving around that, that morph morphospace. We then combine these performance surfaces together into an adaptive landscape by determining the combinations of functional traits that help to optimize, in, in this instance, for the mean phenotype of each of our locomotor ecologies, so terrestrial, semi-aquatic, and marine turtles. So here on the right, you can see um, one of those adaptive landscapes. So this adaptive landscape is specifically for our terrestrial turtles. And the adaptive peak here is in the top right-hand corner of morphospace with this really deep red color indicating a really high performance peak. And I've just on the top here um, shown you the different combinations of functional weights that help to optimize for this particular a landscape. I'm not going to go into the details about that. The other thing that you can see are these dashed lines here. These are called the parato fronts. This is basically a line connecting two peaks. So for instance, the terrestrial peak to the uh, marine peak and the terrestrial peak to the semi-aquatic peak. And what this represents is the highest ridge running from peak to peak. So if you wanted to go across your landscape to go from one peak to another peak, this is the path you would take to optimize your performance at any one time. This is your optimal path. All right, so that's a very quick and dirty introduction into the technique of functional adaptive landscape analysis and the general workflow that we use in order to create these adaptive landscapes. So now what I want to do is apply this technique to two of my favorite transitions in vertebrate evolution. So first we're going to start with the fish to tetrapod transition and the origin of terrestrial locomotion. And we're going to try to address this question of when did tetrapods start moving on land? So fish and tetrapods, they move through their environments in very, very different ways. So fish, obviously they swim in water and their body weight is supported by the buoyancy of water, where tetrapods move over land under the forces of gravity. Fish use their fins for stability and maneuverability, while tetrapods use their limbs for body weight support under those forces of gravity, but also to generate forward thrust. Fish, on the other hand, they tend to use their body axis to generate thrust for swimming, while tetrapods use their body axis to support limb movements and an increased stride length of their limbs, but also to brace their body under the forces of gravity. So moving through water or over land, 
requires very different morphological and functional adaptations. So one of the sort of biggest events in vertebrate evolution was the origin of fully terrestrial tetrapods from aquatically bound fish. So this so-called fish to tetrapod transition started in the middle Devonian about 390 million years ago in our tetrapodomorph fish ancestors, which you can see here. And it culminated pretty much in the early Permian with fully terrestrial tetrapods that had diversified across the globe. So if we look in the fossil record and uh, we find an animal with a fish type body plan, we can probably be pretty confident that it was swimming in water. But if we find one with a tetrapod like body plan, we probably are thinking that this animal is walking on land. But what about these transitional animals in between, these so-called stem tetrapods? These were animals that had both fish-like and tetrapod-like features. So were they swimming in water like a fish or walking on land like a tetrapod or were they doing something else entirely? So a lot of ideas have been put forward and interpretations of these animals are really dependent on the technique that the authors are using in order to study their fossils. So for instance, studies that have looked at bone histology of some of the earliest tetrapods in the fossil record have suggested that the, these animals were still primarily aquatic in habit. Other studies that have looked at three-dimensional modeling uh, tech, have used three-dimensional modeling techniques like stuff that I've done in my work have suggested more of an amphibious life, lifestyle. So these animals were probably maybe limited and probably capable of moving on land, but also moving in the water. And still others that have looked at fossil footprints have suggested that the earliest tetrapods were indeed walking across the terrestrial landscape. So really no consensus has been achieved. There's basically the whole gamut here. So one of the problems that I think is happening here is that each of these studies is, is using a different methodology to, to look at the fossils. They're also looking at completely different fossils at different points in time. And so there's no overlapping information here. So a big driving question in my research has been, when did tetrapods gain the ability to move on land, All right? Was it early on in their evolutionary history or did this occur much later? So we use functional adaptive landscape to address this question. So um, in this study, we looked at the humerus bone uh, or upper arm bone of a high resolution taxonomic data set uh, that ranged across the fish, fish to tetrapod transition. And we chose to look at the humerus bone because it's homologous in all Sarcopterygians, which means that you can find this bone in both fish fins and in tetrapod limbs. It's functionally incredibly important. It helps to anchor the proximal and the distal musculature of the limb or of, of the appendage and therefore it helps to actuate the fin or the limb. The humerus bone is also incredibly abundant in the fossil record. And so we can actually source a really high uh, or a really large data set that goes all across the entire transition, which is really, really interesting. So in this study, we sampled 38 species of fossil taxa, including fully aquatic fish all the way through to fully terrestrial tetrapods. Um, and then we grouped them into three basic locomotor ecologies. First, we had our fish, which we can see here in purple. And we assumed that fish were swimming in water. And fish tend to have a blocky like humorous shape, which you can see here. We then had our second group here, which were our crown tetrapods, which we assumed were walking on land. And crown tetrapods, or at least these fossil crown tetrapods, tend to have a humerus shape that's called tetrahedral in morphology. So basically the proximal and distal end of their humerus has become offset from one another. We then had our third group here, which were our stem tetrapods in green, and I have a question mark because this is basically the locomotor ecology that we're trying to predict in this study. So stem tetrapods, they have a, typically have a flattened humerus that is very L-shaped in outline. So we CT scanned obviously lots of, of species. We made um, 3D surfaces of these bones. And then we quantified the shape of these bones by 
using an automated landmarking technique that applied Car Cartesian coordinates over the entire surface of these digital bones. And as you can see, it does a really good job of um, capturing the full 3D geometry of these bones. We then use these data in order to build our morphospace which is that first step in, in the landscape analysis. All right, so here's the morphospace of humerus evolution across the fish to tetrapod transition. So just to get you oriented here, each colored point is a different species humerus. And what we're seeing here is a variation in pure shape. So all size has been removed from the analysis. So there are a few trends that we can pull out so first of all, we see that our fish group in purple here is sitting in the top left uh, part of morphospace, uh, representing their blocky-like humerus uh, shape. The stem tetrapods are sitting sort of centrally in, in the lower part of morphospace with their L-shaped humerus. I don't know why. Oh, there it is, with their L-shaped humerus. And then our crown tetrapods are moving up towards the right-hand part of morphospace here with their tetrahedral humerus shape. The lines that you're seeing are basically the phylogenetic relationships of these species just projected into the morphospace. So now that, so we've quantified shape here, we now need to measure function. So to do that, we created a grid of all possible combinations of shapes across this morphospace. And then we divide, um, devise six functional traits that we could measure across these shapes that we predicted would be related to locomotor performance. All right, so the first two functional traits that we looked at had to do with mobility at the elbow, one for flexion and one for extension. And we included this trait because across the fish to tetrapod transition, there's actually a change in elbow posture and function, and I'll get into that in a second. We also looked at just the general strength of the humerus under mechanical load that may be experienced during different types of locomotor behaviors, and we measured that using a technique called finite element analysis. So we collected all this data across our entire morphospace and then we projected it back into our morphospace so that we could create our performance surfaces. Um, and that's what you're seeing here, one for each of our functional traits, so flexion at the elbow, extension at the elbow, and then just overall strength of the humerus. And the stars that I've plotted here are indicating the performance peaks of each of those traits. So our final three um, functional traits had more to do with movement of the fin or the limb. So trait four was to look at rotational inertia. So the general idea here is that decreased rotational inertia will reduce the effort to swing the fin or the limb. Uh, trait five was torsion of the humerus. So that's that angular offset between the proximal and distal ends. And if you read the literature, it has long been hypothesized that this twisting of the humerus uh, was important during early tetrapod evolution because it enhanced the proximal distal, proximal, sorry, the protraction retraction distance of the distal limb. And you can ex um, sort of uh, envision this as really helping increase stride length of an animal walking on land. And then our final trait was just relative bone length with the idea here that a longer bone will increase the di displacement at the distal end of that bone, which means that this is just another way that you could increase stride length if you were swinging your limb. So we map those back onto our morphospace to create three more performance surfaces, one for each of our traits, and the stars are indicating our performance peaks here. So we, create, we then took all six of these performance surfaces and we combined them together to create functional adaptive landscapes so that we could test these following hypotheses. So the first hypothesis is that fish and crown tetrapods will occupy distinct adaptive peaks due to their distinct locomotor ecologies, one swimming in water and one's walking on land. Our second hypothesis is that stem tetrapods will have their own unique adaptive peak which will be consistent with their unique humerus morphology. And then finally, hypothesis three is that the water to land transition will be characterized by either an early acquisition of terrestrial abilities or perhaps a late acquisition of terrestrial abilities.
So let's dive into hypothesis one. So what we're looking at here um, are the results for the fish adaptive landscape. So if we look here, we see that the uh, adaptive peak is in the top left-hand corner of morphospace as represented by this red star here. And this uh, adaptive landscape is optimized to two primary functional traits. We see strength of the humerus and flexion at the elbow. So what this means is that this blocky, like humerus shape of these fish was very strong and able to withstand loading in multiple directions, but also that the majority of movement that's happening at the elbow is in flexion. And this makes a lot of sense if you look at the body plan of a fish. Uh, a fish like our uh, tetrapodomorph fish used to not run here. If you look at the pectoral fin, you'll see that it's holding its elbow in a hyper flex or sorry, hyper extended position, which means that all the movement that has to happen at that elbow, it has to happen in flexion. And this flexor movement is really important because it helps to control the fin, but it also helps to support many other behaviors such as station holding or even popping. So now let's look at our crown tetrapods. So our crown tetrapods show an adaptive peak in the top right-hand corner of morphospace as represented by this red star here. And we see that this landscape is optimized to a completely different suite of functional traits. So we see torsion of the humerus, uh, reduced rotational inertia, and we see extension at the elbow. So what does this mean? This means that the tetrahedral humerus shape of crown tetrapods helps to increase stride length through twisting of the humerus. It helps to decrease the effort to swing the limb through redu reduced rotational inertia. And also that the primary movement happening at the elbow is in extension. And again, this makes a lot of sense because tetrapods, like the stem amphibian eriops here, tend to hold their elbows in a flex position. And this flex position, what it does is it helps to push the body weight up off the ground, and it also helps to um, support the body weight under the forces of gravity. So all of that moving, movement is happening in extension. So all of these traits of uh, crown tetrapod humeri you can envision would be incredibly beneficial for locomotion on land. All right. So from this analysis, we were able to show that fish and crown tetrapods occupy distinct adaptive peaks. So we can accept hypothesis one. We're also able to show that adaptations of their humerus to these very different locomotor ecologies resulted in different functional trade-offs that would enhance performance in their very different environments, one in water and one on land. So now let's look at hypothesis two and whether stem tetrapods have their own unique adaptive peak. So when we calculate their landscape, we see that their adaptive peak is in the top right-hand corner of morphospace here, uh, where the red star is. And we also see that this landscape is optimized to its own unique suite of functional traits. We see that it's optimized primarily for humerus length and a more minor contribution of reduced rotational inertia. So what does this mean? This means that the L-shaped humerus of stem tetrapods, uh, like this famous stem te tetrapod here, Acanthus dega, that its um, humerus shape um, resulted in an increased ability to increase stride length through just pure lengthening of the humerus, but also that it reduced the effort to swing the limb through reduced rotational inertia. Both traits that I think would be beneficial for moving on land. So they do have their own unique combination of functional trade-offs, as we can see here. And I think this probably indicates that they probably had unique locomotor behaviors as well. They probably weren't swimming in water like a fish, walking on land like a, a crown tetrapod, but perhaps doing something unique. All right, so even though our stem tetrapods uh, and their landscape um, show us that the humerus bone have their own unique suite of functional trade-offs. The stem tetrapods appear to also share an adaptive peak with crown tetrapods. As you can see, they're both in the top right-hand corner of morphospace. 
So we actually have to reject hypothesis too. Stem tetrapods don't appear to have their own unique adaptive peak. And in a sense, it kind of looks like they are sitting in a performance valley. So tip, and this is, this is odd. This is not what we expected because typically within the sort of context of evolutionary theory, selection should be you know, acting on populations to push populations uphill to cluster around adaptive peaks where performance is gonna be maximized. But I think we can think of this in a slightly different way. Um, selection doesn't always have to be strong. <laughs> if selection is weak on a trait, you may be able to evolve suboptimal morphologies. And in fact, suboptimal morphologies may be central to crossing performance valleys. And so we may be able to think of the stem tetrapod humerus as perhaps a suboptimal or even temporary solution that may have helped facilitate the transition between the fish peak and the tetrapod peak and between water and land. So the other thing I wanna point out here is that typically when selection is strong on a trait, you tend to have uh, contour lines that are tightly spaced together, indicating a high adaptive peak like we have here in the crown tetrapods. But if we look at the stem tetrapods, we see something different. We see uh, widely spaced contour lines that are vertically oriented. And so when I saw, saw this, I thought of an image from Simpson. He illustrated something very similar and he called this linear selection. And he defined linear selection as the tendency for selection to drive populations towards new, previously unexplored peaks. And I thought this made a lot of sense in the context of the fish to tetrapod transition where tetrapods were trying to break away from that ancestral aquatic habitat and move towards the previously unexplored terrestrial environment. All right, so let's uh, finish this part of the talk by trying to address hypothesis three and whether or not tetrapods gain the ability to move on land either early or late in their evolutionary history. So when we did our landscape analysis, we found that there were two primary uh, adaptive peaks in our amorphous base. There was one for fish and there was one for crown tetrapods. So what we decided to do was to combine them together to create a water to land transitional landscape. And that's what you can see here on the left. So on this water to land transitional landscape, darker blue indicates you're higher on the aquatic side of the landscape and darker brown indicates that you're higher on the terrestrial side of the landscape. This white zone here is the transition front in between the two. We then plotted all of our species on here and we calculated their height on this transitional landscape. And that's what you're seeing here with all these numbers and I don't, don't worry about the specific numbers. Basically, if on this landscape, if you are below one, you're towards the aquatic side of the landscape and if you're above one, you're towards the terrestrial side of the landscape. So for example, if we plot our tetrapodomorph fish eusinopteron here, we see that the numbers are very low, well below one. It makes sense, it's sitting high on the aquatic side of the landscape. On the other hand, our fully terrestrial crown tetrapod ophiacodon here has numbers well above one, meaning that it's sitting very high on the terrestrial side of the landscape. All right, so what are our stem tetrapods doing? Well, if we look at them, we see that stem tetrapods are actually hovering around the water to land transitional front, which I think is indicating that they're sitting in this performance valley, just as we had predicted based on their landscape analysis. However, if we look at where these individual species are sitting, we see that the earliest um, tetrapods from the late Devonian actually breach the transition front and they're sitting low on the terrestrial landscape. And we see this that this uh, carry through even into taxa from the earliest part of the Carboniferous and some are even actually getting quite high on that terrestrial landscape. So what I think this is indicating is that stem tetrapods probably did have some capacity to move on land. However, their capacity was probably lim limited by the morphology of their humerus or just general morphology of their body. Um, there's many other characteristics there. And I really think that it wasn't until we have, oh, sorry, 
So we have to, so I, I'm accepting the hypothesis at the moment that terrestrial abilities probably evolved early on in tetrapod evolution. But it probably wasn't until the crown group and the origin of this tetrahedral humerus shape with all of its unique functional characteristics for locomotion on land that tetrapods were finally able to climb this terrestrial landscape and basically take over the terrestrial environment. All right, so I just want to summarize this part of the talk now. So we were able to use functional adaptive landscape analysis to show that humorous evolution resulted in functional trade-offs associated with the transition from water to land. That the L-shaped humerus in stem tetrapods may have been a temporary solution that helped to facilitate the transition uh, across the water to land performance valley. That the capacity to move on land seems to evolve, at least I think early on in tetrapod evolution, but I do think that their abilities were very limited at this time. And then finally, effective terrestrial locomotion, locomotion does not appear until evolution of that tetrahedral humerus shape with all of its unique functional adaptations for uh, movement on land. So before I end this part of the talk, I just want to say, obviously this is just one anatomical module in an entire locomotory system. So, you know, you do have to take that into consideration, but we are continuing this work. We're continuing to apply this to other modules within the locomotory system, but also my lab uses many other different techniques to, set, to study this evolutionary event, and I'd be happy to talk more about that. Okay, so for the last part of this talk, what I want to do is completely change gears and talk about the reptile to mammal transition and the evolution of mammalian locomotion and specifically addressing the question, how did the mammalian backbone evolve? So mammals and reptiles, they also move through their environments in very different ways. So reptiles like this monitor lizard here are considered to retain the ancestral stance and gait in which their limbs are held out to the sides of their body in what's called a sprawling like limb stance and their backbone moves via lateral undulation or side to side movements. And the side to side movements of the backbone help to enhance stride length of those sprawling limbs. So mammals on the other hand, like this cheetah here, they're considered to have a derived stance and gait. So mammals have tuck their limbs up underneath their body in what's called an upright limb posture in which the limbs are primarily being moved in a single plane. And their backbone has become highly regionalized and is able to, to perform many different functions. In particular, the lower back or the lumbar region here is able to move in the sagittal plane or it can move up and down. And the sagittal movement of the backbone helps to increase stride length of those upright limbs and it also allows mammals to move at incredibly high speeds. So the evolution of this mammalian locomotor system has really been thought to be key to the ecological success of mammals. But how did it evolve? Now really to get at this question, we have to look at the fossil record. So mammals, they're part of a much larger group called the synapsids. And synapsids and reptiles, the other major group of amniotes, they diverge from each other around 320 million years ago in the Carboniferous period. Now the earliest um, uh, synapsids um, are typically grouped together in a grade called the non-mammalian synapsids. And this grade basically dominated the Permian period, but they went extinct just as mammals were starting to take ho hold in the early Jurassic. Now the earliest members of these non-mammalian synapsids, the polycosaurs, like this Ophiacodon here, they didn't really look much like a mammal. They actually had these sprawling limbs and these large, long tails. And in fact, their morphology looks more superficially like this reptile here, this monitor lizard. And because of this, it's long been thought that reptiles represent a great modern analog for how these early non-mammalian synapsids may have stood and moved. Essentially, they kind of look the same, so they kind of move the same. So based on this, um, the transition uh, or the evolution of the mammalian locomotor system has typically been considered uh, in the limbs, the sprawling to upright transition in the limbs, so going from sprawling to upright. 
and the lateral to sagittal transition in the backbone, so moving laterally, side to side, to having that ability to move up and down. And because of this, it's long, you know, non-mammalian synapses are often reconstructed in the literature as having these sprawling limbs and a lot of lateral undulation of their backbone. Now, the sprawling to upright transition in mammals has been a topic of intense investigation for almost a century, but the lateral to sagittal transition has pretty much been neglected and hasn't been quantitatively tested until now. So we asked the question, did the mammalian backbone evolve from reptile-like lateral bending to mammal-like sagittal bending? Or, just to put it another way, was there a simple one-to-one -one trade-off? So we used functional adaptive landscape to find out. So in this study, we sampled 86 species that included modern salamanders, reptiles, and mammals, as well as 13 exquisitely preserved non-mammalian synapsid fossils. We CT scanned them, and then we created uh, 3D models of their vertebral columns. Now, there are a lot of vertebrae in the vertebral column, so we needed to downsample that. So we decided to take five vertebrae along the anterior to posterior uh, length of the vertebral column. We then took those vertebrae and we landmarked them with those Cartesian coordinate systems so that we could capture the geometry of each of the vertebrae. We then took that and we concatenated all that data together, basically to create an uber vertebrae <laughs> for each of, each of the taxa that we were looking at. We then analyzed this data and we created our morphospace. So here you can see that morphospace. Um, again, so each dot is a different species, but it also represents the shape data for five different vertebrae. Again, we've removed size, so this is just pure shape. So just to give you a sense of what's going on in this morphospace, we see that salamanders in pink and reptiles in green are occupying the top region of morphospace. Our mammals in orange are representing the bottom area of morphospace, and we can see that they're very diverse. And then finally, our non-mammalian synapses in purple here are sort of uh, centrally and off to the right of morphospace. We also see that none of these groups appear to be overlapping with one, each <laughs> with one another, which means that they probably have unique vertebral morphologies. So now we wanted to measure function, so how did we do that? We actually uh, called on some experimental data that we had collected for a prior study. So in this study, we excised the vertebral columns of uh, cadaveric mammals and reptiles. We then conducted uh, bending experiments uh, where we basically loaded vertebrae and we calculated two mechanical properties of the intervertebral joints. Those two properties were the maximum range of motion that the intervertebral joint could achieve under load and also the compliance of that or basically how quickly it would achieve that maximum range of motion. So we did that for every uh, intervertebral joint along the uh, backbone, and we plotted out the patterns. So here you can see the patterns from a domestic cat, looking at range of motion data on the top, compliance data on the bottom. And we measured these variables in multiple planes of motion. So we looked at lateral bending, sagittal bending, so a dorsal and ventral movement, and we also looked at torsion, or basically axial twisting. We then used this data to devise some metrics that we could directly measure on our vertebrae that were in our morphospace. So to go over this quickly, we looked at stiffness of the vertebrae, which was uh, calculated as the second moment of area. And this had a 95% correlation with our compliance data, our experimental compliance data. We also looked at sagittal versus lateral mobility and we calculated this as the angle of the zygopophyses from the vertical plane. And this had a 77% correlation with our experimental range of motion data. We also looked at twisting mobility, and this was the angle of the zygopophyses here from the arc of rotation. And this had a 97% correlation with our experimental range of motion data. So, we took these, we measured these variables of every single vertebrae within our morphospace, and then we ended up with way too much data. So we then <laughs> did some data reduction, and after some data reduction, we were able to come up with uh, four performance surfaces. So we had a performance surface that represented stiffness of the vertebral column, 
one that represented how much mobility and torsion there was in the anterior part of the vertebral column, and then two that were related. One was related, one was anterior mobility, and one was posterior mobility, and in this case, sort of the higher the number, the more lateral mobility there was, and the lower the number, the more sagittal mobility. So we combine these all together uh, to address the following questions. So our first hypothesis is that mammals and reptiles will occupy distinct adaptive peaks due to their distinct axial functions. Hypothesis two is that non-mammalian synapses will share similar adaptive peak to extant reptiles, which is their presumed locomotor analog, as I mentioned before. And hypothesis three is that the reptile to mammal transition will be characterized by a lateral to sagittal functional shift and this will also include a migration from the reptile peak to the mammal peak. So let's look at hypothesis one. So on the left, we can see the adaptive landscape for mammals, and on the right, we can see the adaptive uh, landscape for reptiles. And when we do pairwise comparisons between these landscapes, we see that they are statistically different from one another, and we also see that their adaptive peaks are in different regions of morphospace. So we can accept hypothesis one, mammals and reptiles do have different adaptive peaks. We can also see that these different landscapes are optimized to different combinations of functional traits. Mammals are optimized to multiple functions which is consistent with their highly regionalized vertebral column. So we see that it, they have a high amount of lateral mobility in the anterior column. They have a relatively high amount of anterior torsion and then they have primarily sagittal mobility posteriorly. And this, all of this motion is done under a relative degree of stiffness. If we look at the reptiles, however, we see that their landscape is optimized to one primary uh, function, which is lateral mobility of the posterior column. And again, this makes complete sense, considering we know that reptiles move primarily side to side uh, when they locomote. So this blue um, part of the pie here is indicating that really high amount of lateral mobility. So now let's look at our non-mammalian synapsids. So here's the adaptive landscape for this group. And when we do the pairwise comparisons uh, between the non-mammalian synapsid landscape and our reptile landscape, we see that they are significantly different from one another. We also see that their peaks are in different regions of morphospace. So in fact, we need to reject hypothesis two. Non-mammalian synapsids do not share an adaptive peak with reptiles, their presumed locomotor analog. We also see that uh, non-mammalian synapsids in mammals have different adaptive landscapes as well. When we look at the functional traits that optimize for this landscape, we see that non-mammalian synapsids are heavily weighted for axial stiffness right here. And in fact, if we look at this pie chart compared to the reptile pie chart, we see that they're almost the opposite of one another. So we see that non-mammalian synapsids have really high stiffness and a lower amount of posterior mobility, whereas reptiles have this really high amount of posterior mobility, lateral mobility, and they're doing it under a very compliant system. So very, very different vertebral morphologies and very, very different vertebral functions. All right, so finally to ad address our last hypothesis, um, whether or not the um, basically reptile to mammal transition included a lateral to sagittal functional shift, this simple one-to-one -one trade off. So in order to address this question, what we did is uh, we calculated the height of each of our species in our analysis on each of the three landscapes that we that we calculated, we then plotted this as a ternary diagram. So if you're towards one part, I can't really see that, if you're towards one part of the corner, you're more highly um, optimized for one particular landscape, whereas if you're in the middle, you're more highly, you're sort of in between these landscapes. Um, then what we did is that we measured and plotted the peritofronts fronts onto this. So this is the reptile to mammal perito front, front or the line that you would take going from the reptile peak to the mammal peak while optimizing performance. We also did the same thing for the non-mammalian synapsid peak to the mammal peak. And when we do this, we can see that the line connecting the reptile to mammal peak goes through a vacant region of morphospace, and most importantly, there are no non-mammalian synapsids there. 
So we're going to reject hypothesis three that the mammalian backbone did not evolve from a, by a simple one-to-one -one functional shift. And in fact, what we see is that our non-mammalian synapses, which we can see here in purple, are following more along this uh, non-mammalian synapsid mammal parotil front. And I think that this makes for a much more intriguing evolutionary story because this means that the evolution of the mammalian backbone didn't just involve the evolution of sagittal mobility, but involved multiple functional changes to the mammalian backbone. These include a decreasing overall stiffness, so this red part of the pie chart, increasing axial twisting, relatively more lateral mobility, which we can see here, and then the evolution of that sagittal mobility posteriorly. Okay, so now just to summarize this part of the talk, so we were able to use this new technique of functional adaptive landscape analysis to show the following. First, the lateral to sagittal transition, I think is just like far too simple to explain mammalian backbone evolution. That extant reptiles are a poor functional analog for extinct non-mammalian synapsids, at least when it comes to the backbone. That non-mammalian synapsid backbones are characterized by really high stiffness and not lateral compliance like we see in modern day reptiles. And then finally, mammal backbone evolution involved acquisition of multiple vertebral fun functions, not just the evolution of sagittal mobility. And again, I think this paints a much more interesting story than is often portrayed in the literature. So just to let you know, we have a new study that we're just finalizing right now that's looking at humerus evolution in uh, this transition, trying to get at more of that sprawling to upright uh, transition in the limbs. So we're excited about that. So that brings me to the end of my talk. <clears throat> so I would like to thank uh, Julia <laughs> for inviting me today. Um, to um, hot and steamy Texas. Um, <laughs> uh, I also want to thank uh, my lab at Harvard, and in particular, I want to call out two people. My prior PhD student, Blake Dixon, who um, took on board uh, functional adaptive landscape analysis and really ran with it and created all the code behind this, which we recently put into an R package called Morphoscape. If you're interested in that, please let me know. Uh, he was also the one that uh, was the first author on the early tetrapod study that I talked about. And then finally, uh, my prior postdoc, Katrina Jones, who uh, was really inspired by the work uh, that Blake and I were doing, and she applied the same technique to the mammalian backbone study. Also, I have lots of colleagues to thank too many, to write lots of museums and museum staff that helped to support our work, like it's done in paleontology over and over again. So with that, thank you all for joining me.